Hello. Thank you. Clicker. Cool. Thank you very much. How does that work, actually? Yeah. Next slide. Next slide. Cool. Also, you can probably recognize my French accent. We're actually going to do that in English because Tahir <laughs> is going to present uh, together with me. We're, we're going to do that together, and he's coming from London. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so, quick Hello. intro. Yeah. Does it work yours? Yeah. Cool. Quick, uh, quick intro. Who we are? So, we are both Google Analytics Premium consultants. Uh, it means that we basically work with our clients using the paid version of, uh, of uh, Google uh, Analytics. Uh, and we support them implementing the platform on both the web, mobile devices, uh, and basically any, any use that you want to do of it. Anything else yeah. on that, Tahir? Yes, perfect. Yeah. So I'm no? Tahir Faiz. I'm based in a London office, so do the same thing, but yeah, for UK clients. Yeah, and I'm based on the Paris office doing that for like Southern Europe and mostly French, uh, mostly French clients. Cool. So today we'll be talking about how to know more about your mobile users through uh, through Google uh, Analytics. And first thing first, what do we mean about mobile, and which devices are people using? You might have heard about the Google Consumer Barometer, which has been a survey commissioned by uh, by Google during 2014 and 2015, and we basically ask people which devices they are using to access the web. Would that be apps or, or website? And what they said is that, that was in France also, by the way. And what they said is that a swooping 74% of people said they are accessing the web through computer. Would that be desktop, laptop, or, or netbook? 62% of people said they are accessing the web through smartphone. And 32% of people they said they are accessing the web through a tablet. So now that's the general usage. But we wanted to zoom in a little bit more about what's exactly the smartphone usage and how is mobile important and smartphone important into that, um, into that landscape. What we found out, and hopefully you can read that, uh, is that basically 16% of users in France say they are accessing the internet, so web and apps, primarily via a smartphone and more via a smartphone than via a computer or a tablet. So 16% of, uh, of people. 31% of people said they are accessing the web uh, equally via smartphone or tablet, so still a mobile device. And just 45% of people said they are using another means of smartphone, so tablet or computer, to access the web. So smartphone is definitely, as we all know, very important for the people to access the internet. And I'm saying web since the beginning, but it's actually internet, so either web or, or apps here. What does this mean for us in terms of measurement with, uh, with Google Analytics? Have some of you, by the way, been using analytics for measuring web performances already, or even apps? Yeah, cool. So some of you know about, uh, about it already. Perfect. So if you know about it, so basically you can use analytics to measure your website. And the good thing is that all the stuff you can do to measure your website, you can also do to measure your mobile activity. Will that be, again, web? Or, or apps. So for a website, you can measure your acquisition. Where are people coming from in terms of marketing campaigns? Or are they coming directly uh, to your website if you have a very strong brand recognition, for example? Uh, you can measure what they do on your website, which screens they're exploring, and which action they take. And you can <coughs> sorry, m measure uh, also and remarket on, uh, on those users to re-engage them on, uh, on the website. All that stuff you can also do on, um, on mobile, and we're going to see that uh, today. So what we see, basically, is that the technology and the tools are already there for measurement and optimization. Since another study uh, conducted, not by Google this time, but, di but by uh, VentureBit, was pretty interesting for us. So I don't know if you feel the same. You can maybe, maybe tell us. It was conducted in 2014. 238 developers have been interviewed. And what they said is that basically one in three uh, app developer felt they did not know how a user were finding their application and how they did acquire new user for, for the app. Right? This is quite strong, 33% of app developers. And at the same time, 52% of developers from this study say that the main metric for us was a co for them sorry, was a cost per install. So measuring cost per install when you don't really know where a user are coming from, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, complicated. Again, you can do that on the web with GA. You can also do that on mobile with GA. And I'm going to show you how you can do that on, uh, on the App Store, the Apple App Store, 
and on the Google Play Store, so hopefully you can link uh, your, your app engagement with actual user acquisition for those two stores. <coughs> Sorry. First of all, the iOS uh, App Store. So you can basically tie an advertising click, which is made in-app, right, to user engagement into your own app. So let's say you're a retailer and you're doing advertising in whichever website, let's say Le Monde, for example. So you show a banner in, uh, in, uh, in Le Monde, and this banner redirects to your own app when someone clicks uh, into, uh, into it. On the App Store, you can basically uh, understand that the user opened your app or was acquired coming from your Le Monde marketing campaign. Right? How can we do that, or how do we do that, knowing that the Apple App Store is kind of a black box in, um, in, uh, in the middle between the advertising campaign and the actual app installation is basically by using Google Analytics redirects. So if you want to do that, it is directly integrated with all the uh, ad networks you see, uh, you see down there. You can use manual tracking for any, uh, any ad network that, accept, uh, that is not listed here, but that accepts redirection URLs. How do we do that is that we ask you, instead of linking directly your marketing campaign to the Apple App Store, we ask you to use a GA redirection URL instead. Right? So what happens is that someone clicks on the ad on your marketing campaign, then instead of going straight to the Apple App Store, it goes to the GA redirection URL, and then the GA redirection URL automatically sends this, the user to the Apple App Store. The user gets the app, opens it, and that's it. So what uh, does this redirection URL do, and how does it work? Uh, exactly. The thing with the app, of course, as you know, is that we don't have cookies. So cookies is what you use, what we use in analytics on the web to basically understand in time a single user activity. So a GA cookie, so analytics cookie, will basically look like a random string, which is non-personally identifiable information, and which basically is stored on the on the on the user's browser for both desktop web and, uh, and mobile web. We don't have that on the app. So what we use. And, um, is what we call advertising IDs or IDFS, depending if you're on uh, Apple uh, or Android uh, devices. And have you heard about that already, IDFS advertising IDs? No? Okay. This is basically the exact counterpart of cookies for uh, mobile devices, for native apps. So how it works is that this is a randomly generated string of characters hosted on your device. This is different from the device ID because this one can be opted out or it can be resetted by the user by going to the device's settings. Right? So you can really think of it like a cookie, but for a mobile device. And this is exactly what we use. So when someone clicks on an ad on, a, on iOS, it goes to the analytics redirection URL. From this URL, we get this IDFA or advertising ID. Right? Then it goes to the App Store. From the App Store, the user installs the ad. He opens the ad. When you open the ad, hopefully, and we're going to show that afterwards, uh, you can install the analytics code within, uh, within your app, and it will send some analytics hits to our Google server. And part of, of those hits, you will find the IDFA advertising ID. So basically, we have the same identifier for both the ad click and the actual app usage, and we can tie your marketing campaigns to, uh, to actual advertising or marketing campaigns. Of course, you get all the acquisition in, um, in analytics. So if you can track your marketing campaigns, you will get them. If someone is just going through the App Store and is just downloading your app without passing through a marketing campaign, you will see that as direct traffic within your analytics uh, account. Make sense? Yeah, cool. For the Play Store, things are a little bit uh, different. So first of all, we have a native integration uh, between uh, the Google Play Store and, uh, and Google uh, Analytics. And what this integration will give you is that it will give you aggregate number uh, into uh, Analytics. So this is not at the user level for privacy reasons. This is just at the aggregated uh, number level for this specific one. What you will get is basically for each of your marketing channel or marketing campaigns, you will get the number of uh, app views into the Google Play Store, uh, app installs, and, um, and new users. Right. This is in aggregates and just the Play Store metrics, not yet the actual engagement with, uh, with your app. If you want to get the actual engagement with your apps, you can still get it. And actually, it's not exactly the same uh, than for iOS, because for Android, we don't need to use this redirection, um, this redirection uh, URL. 
for the few of you who have used already GA on your mobile uh, site, you might be familiar with these so-called UTM parameters. Right? Do you know them, guys? Yeah? Some of you? Cool. So UTM is basically when you will define uh, how your website was being, uh, was being found. For example, say someone is coming from newsletter, you will say UTM campaign equal newsletter winter 2015 whatever. Uh, if it's coming from a display advertising, you will say the same, and so on and so forth for all your marketing campaigns. The exact same mechanism can be applied to, uh, to the apps with the Google Play Store, because what happens uh, is that you can use the same campaigns within the Play Store URL that you put into your marketing uh, campaigns, right? so the same parameters, and then the Play Store will broadcast those parameters over to the actual app. Right? So let's say you have UTM campaigns equal uh, I'm actually not sure the name is UTM, but the logic is exactly the same. Uh, UTM campaign for apps. And uh, yeah. same, same yeah. yeah, cool, thank you. Uh, let's say you put UTM campaign equal newsletter winter 2015, right? That's into your marketing campaign URL that you use for the App Store. Then this parameter will be passed over to the Google Play Store, sorry. And uh, the Google Play Store will pass that over to the app. When the user will open the app, what will happen is that, again, the eight will be sent to GA, and it will include this UTM campaign parameter, so we can give you uh, acquisition reports for, for, for the Play Store. Cool. So that's acquisition. And obviously, this is important, but analytics is not only about acquisition. You can understand much more through, uh, through GA. <coughs> and same as, actually, the web. Some of the things you can understand is basically which screens are being used in, uh, in your apps. So if someone going through screen A to screen B to screen C, or from screen A to, to screen C to screen B, and so on and so forth. So you get a complete flow of all the screens which are being viewed in, um, in your app. Which actions are being taken? So this is really up to you to define what is an action that you want to track according to the goal you have in, um, in, uh, in your app. Let's say if you're a news website, you might want to track the number of article reads uh, into, uh, into the app. If you're a retailer, you might want to track the number of purchases done into the app. And if you're a gaming uh, website, and this is taken from Ingress, some of you might know about, uh, you might want to track the number of level ups or the number of in-app purchases or, or whatever. And this is using the exact same mechanisms that you're using for the web. So basically, if you have implemented GA for the web, the, same, the concept will be the same for, for the app. We have a concept of custom metrics, we have a concept of event, we have a concept of in e commerce module in, uh, in GA. All that is available for the web, and you will also have that available for the actual app tracking. Finally, errors. This is really important. Actually, it could maybe be even more important for apps than, uh, than for web, do some time to, to connectivity issue. So what you will get with GA is that it will automatically track uh, any exception or any crash. So fatal exception, basically, you have, uh, you have into, uh, into your app. Right? So when you find an exception, you can send it over automatically to, uh, to GA, and then we'll get complete report on which devices are causing um, crashes or, or, or exceptions, uh, on which uh, screens, and, um, and so on and so forth. Right. So what are potential use cases? Uh, for example, your internal search engine that you turn no result for functional reason, that can be tracked through, uh, through, through GA. Or your app crashes, so it's like an uh, unexpected uh, failure, it can also be available in, um, in GA. We don't know always with apps if user will be connected or not uh, on his device. So the way GA works in terms of connectivity is that basically if someone is using an app but the device is not connected, the hits will be queued right, right onto the device and they will be sent the next time the device is connected to the, uh, to the internet. And I don't know exactly how it works in terms of coding, but this can also be uh, used using the background processes for, for iOS or Android. To give you an idea of what it could look like in GA, uh, for the few of you who have never seen GA, so basically this is GA for apps. You see it looks almost the same than GA for web, only some menus will be different, app overview. And I don't see it here. Actually, yeah, crash is an exception. Obviously, you will love that only when you set up GA for an app and not when you set up GA for a mobile um, website or a desktop website. It's probably the most graphical report in terms of seeing navigation a user is taking through a, 
website on app. Uh, and you can see the pages or the screens the user is going through in green of the event that you've chosen to track yourself uh, that the user is going through here in, um, in blue. Right, so now we get reports, we get metrics. What you can also do uh, in GA, you can do that on the web and you can also do that for apps again. You try to get a message, basically what you can do for the web, you can do for apps in, uh, in, uh, in GA, is, uh, is segmentation. So the idea is that not only you get some reports for your overall population of users, but you can basically understand for a specific group of those users, how they are using your app and what can be causing uh, success or failure in uh, having uh, the user doing what you want to them to do on, um, on your app. In this example, I used acquisition, technology, and behavioral based segmentation. Actually, just technology and behavioral. Technology would be I want to segment on user who use the app version 2.0.1. And um, behavioral would be I want to segment on user who navigated on my app more than one hour, that's it expressed in, uh, in seconds, and who have not generated any revenue through my uh, app. So that would basically be, let's say, user using the latest version of the app, who have been highly engaged with the app for more than one hour, uh, and would generate no revenue. For those users, all the reports we discussed about before, like acquisition, marketing campaigns, um, flows, navigating from screen to screen or events to event, and errors and crashes, you can understand specifically for this group uh, what they're seeing in your app and potentially optimize your app for this group accordingly. Yeah. So that is acquisition technology and behavioral. What you can also do with analytics is that you can import your own data within, uh, within Google Analytics again. Uh, as long as there's no personally identifiable information within that data because that is forbidden and we cannot put that in, um, in, um, in analytics. So the way it works is that it's basically called data import and the kind of thing you can do with it can be, I think a good example for that would be a membership status for, for clients. Let's say you're a retailer website, so you're a retailer, you have a website, you have an app, uh, and that's basically it. Since you're a retailer, you want your people to log in potentially before they make an actual purchase on your website or app. So you log in. If they log in, you have kind of a profile ID or user ID within your own backend, right? And let's say you're a big retailer, so you have a membership status, and you classify your members uh, or your users within four buckets, non-members, silvers, gold, and, uh, and platinum. Now, this is a data that GA doesn't have on its own because it's not something like technology. It's not something like um, like uh, navigation from screen to screen, it's really data that belongs to you in terms of who do you qualify your users within your own systems. There's two ways of approaching sending this data over to GA. One would be basically including this data as a custom dimensions uh, through the actual code that you send for every single screen to GA. This has these advantages and, uh, and, um, and drawback. The other uh, alternative to that, which we tend to prefer, is actually using this data import, so you can send this data offline through batch processes, API or manual upload, without actually having to send through it. Right? So it's like more confidentiality because you don't have that uh, through the app and through the code sent over to, uh, to GA. And it's also uh, lighter hits because basically there's information you don't send over the network, but you just send over to GA yourself uh, via batch, uh, batch uh, upload. <coughs> So the way it works is pretty simple. You will choose a key and you will choose an imported data. In this example, the key will be the user ID that you send over to GA. So this one, it is a key. It would have to be actually sent with the actual hit, so the actual for each screen of your mobile uh, application. And then you can say to this key, I want to associate other data, like for example, a loyalty segment. And if you go for the manual upload, you can just create an Excel document or a spreadsheet. You basically have a number of user IDs. For each of the user ID, you associate a membership status. You send that over to GA. And then GA starts automatically classifying all your data. And you can then segment your user from, uh, from this data. Yeah. Cool. So we've seen acquisition, behavior, uh, and segmentation within the tool. One of the last thing. Uh, we, can, uh, we can do with a GA is actually re-engaging with, um, with existing users, so commonly called remarketing. So remarketing works on the web, and again, 
it can, uh, it can work in app also. The way we're marketing data, uh, the way, sorry, GRE marketing uh, works is basically that the same segments we've seen before, you can use them not only for uh, reporting purposes and analysis purposes, but you can also use them for remarketing purposes. What do we mean by remarketing? Let's say someone uh, goes either to an app or to a website and is looking for some, uh, for some uh, flights. You will segment those users looking for those flights in GA, and you will just say, okay, this segmentation, I don't want to use it only for reporting, but I want to use it for uh, remarketing. When you do that, you can send the information over to AdWords, or if you're premium clients, you might want to send, if you have heard about that, uh, the list over to a tool called Double Click Bid Manager, which is called to buy media in, a, in, a, in real time. And then you could start target this user. Targeting will mean two things. It will mean basically showing an ad to them or not, right? Or it could mean something else, which is showing a specific marketing message to them rather than a generic marketing message. Let's say you're again a retailer, you're seeing tons of equipment. You sell Android tablets and you sell um, iPad. Someone is looking for an iPad on your website. You probably want to show an iPad again if, he, if the user have not bought the iPad on your website since, uh, since then. That's the kind of thing you can do with your marketing. Uh, and how it works is that so if you have a mobile website, you can retarget people or remarket people on the web, right? So show ads on the web. And if someone, if you're using a mobile app, you can uh, retarget people for the mobile app inventory. Yeah, makes sense. How we do that, again, is based on cookies and uh, IDFS and, uh, and advertising IDs. So for the web, uh, we collect the visitor ID through the cookie and we send that over to, to, to AdWords, so AdWords can show an ad for those specific cookies. And for the in-app, we do exactly the same, but instead of cookies, we, don't, uh, we just use the advertising IDs or, or IDFA, which are the counterpart for mobile devices. Yeah. Cool. So now we've seen what can be done with GA uh, for tracking, measuring, and optimizing mobile devices, mostly phones and, uh, and tablets. Uh, and I'm gonna head over uh, to Tai for showing you the most exciting <laughs> part of the future, which is more devices and more interconnected devices. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one of the problems you might have when now we've got users on so many different devices and try, is trying to measure that across these different channels. Um, so one of the things you might, see if you do use Google Analytics, you'll have noticed we uh, launched Universal Analytics uh, a few years ago. And that was kind of done so that we can start measuring across different devices. Um, so we've got some more stats, because we love stats. Um, so on average, there's four devices um, per user. That might be at work, at home, uh, mobile, tablet. 38% um, of people um, do a journey that involves more than one um, device. Uh, and probably the more important one is 67% start on one device and then continue uh, shopping or um, research for travel on a different device. Um, so what Google did was kind of see how can we um, start to overcome that. So traditionally with um, analytics, they used to be based, um, used to be quite disconnected for all your different channels. So every single device, um, so we've been talking about web and app, every single device would, be, would have a individual um, client ID so it'd be the cookie for your mobile, it'll be um, for your web, sorry, and then you have IDFA um, for the apps, and then something else for offline tracking. Uh, so what that means is it goes into your Google Analytics accounts, and all, that could be one user, but they're going to be seen as five different users. Um, so what you can do now in the analytics code is supply a user ID. Uh, so whenever a user logs in, you supply that user ID, uh, which you get from your CRM or your back-end system. And then Google Analytics will use that to stitch the users together. And then in your reports, you'll start to see one user instead of five different users. Um, so what that allows us to do is get different reports. So we can start to get reports like the device overlap. So you can start to see what percentage of users are using uh, different devices. Um, and that can be important for different reasons. So if you're looking to do certain campaigns across different devices, if you haven't got much overlap, then it's probably not worth doing those cross-device campaigns. Um, but yeah, just trying to understand what your users are doing. Um, 
You can start to look at uh, the device paths, so people starting on mobile and then purchasing on their desktop uh, or vice versa. So again, another report that can be quite useful for different metrics. Um, and then you can even start to look at acquisition device. So going back to the beginning where we were talking about understanding what campaigns are working for you, where are you spending money, you can start to see is someone clicking on a PPC ad on the mobile but then buying on the desktop, you might think that PPC is not working or another campaign is not working. And with reports like this, you can start to see if the kind of cross-channel um, campaigns are working for you. Um, so that was kind of one of the um, new features. Um, I mean, it's been out for two years, but still it's something clients are getting, starting to implement uh, now. Um, so what I want to talk about now is kind of more about the future of analytics. So what does the future of analytics hold? Um, not just Google Analytics, the industry in general. Um, I think the problem, again, is that there's going to be even more um, internet-connected devices. Um, even with Android, we're starting to see that it's going into watches, it's going into the car, it's going into the TV. Um, so if you've got users using so many different devices and you want to understand that, um, what can we do about that? Um, we're going to have Beacon soon, um, which Google's also starting to support with Eddystone. Um, and then even things like Project We from Google, which is, which is aimed to connect any device to the internet. So the kind of solution with Google Analytics is uh, the measurement protocol. Um, so this was designed to allow you to track any device. Um, so the way it works, similar to how you have a hit sent in from your tracking code from the web or the SDK, you can now create that hit yourself and send that into Google Analytics. So this is just a simple example of how you would send in an event um, from your server. So I thought what we do is maybe go back to basics and see, can we track SMS messages? Uh, one of the requests we have from clients is saying, we want to track our SMS campaigns. How can we do that? Um, and before, that was pretty difficult to do. Um, but now, with services like Twilio, you have um, cloud services for SMS that allow you to send SMSs, receive SMSs. Um, so this is kind of a simple example. You could send all of your SMS messages using uh, the Twilio API. Um, you'd get a response to say that message was sent. And then you can bring that back to your server, match up the mobile number with your CRM, get the user ID, uh, because you can't send mobile numbers into Google Analytics because of um, PII. And then you can send that into Google Analytics. So you can start to see that actually tracking SMS messages isn't too difficult. Um, the way it works is in Twilio, <coughs> you would set up a webhook. Um, is anyone familiar with using webhooks? Different services? Yeah. So a webhook essentially something happens in a cloud platform, and when that action occurs, it will send something to your server. So you would set up some code in your server. Um, Twilio will say, send you this information about the text message, so what was in the text message, um, and what number it's sent from, what country it's sent from. And then you can write some code. Um, I'm not going to go into too much information, but essentially you can read that code, uh, the message that's sent to your server, turn that into a um, Google Analytics hook, um, sorry, turn it into the measurement protocol and send that into Google Analytics. Uh, whoops, wrong way. I think we can potentially, I've built a demo to show you how that works, so we can maybe try that in real time. Can we switch to this, please? Cool. So I don't know if anyone wants to try this with me, so I'm hoping it works. But it's a UK number, so I'll warn you that you might get charged. Um, so I'm going to try to do this in real time. So if it works, if it doesn't work, don't laugh at me. Cool. 
So, I mean, I love food, as you all do. And so whenever I build these demos, I try to build, build a kind of restaurant app. So this idea is that you have, an, uh, I have a food delivery company, and people can text me what they want, and then I can send that food to them or deliver that food to them. So I'm going to say, I want some pizza. So let's see if that works. Oh, cool, we've got some. <laughs> so someone wants kebabs. Oh, good choice. <laughs> and my pizza one, oh, there you go. Cool. So you can see tracking any kind of, well, this isn't even really seen as a cloud service, but thanks to things like Twilio, we can start to track um, different types of things. And that's actually it. Uh, thank you. Any questions? I did something uh, similar to what you did, and uh, cool. I started tracking many events, uh, not uh, SMS, but other things with uh, Google Analytics. Yeah. And at some point, uh, the number of sessions was pretty high. Okay. Uh, and I started to have uh, visual charts that were based on uh, less than 10% of uh, the number of sessions. Uh, now I have my total number of events, uh, which is not accurate based on uh, the numbers uh, uh, shown uh, on the table just below. Yeah. And I don't know if I can trust uh, the data in, my, uh, in Google Analytics anymore. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, we discovered that uh, the Google Analytics API yeah. remained accurate. So if we fetch all the data via this API, uh, we have the real data. Okay. But we can't use the dashboard anymore because uh, we don't have real data anymore. Um, I mean, yeah, uh, do you want me to, I'll take this one. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's a fair question. So um, we get. So obviously Google Analytics has sampling. I mean, what kind of, are you looking at long date range? Or are you looking at- No, just, uh, just uh, on the last 30 days. Last 30 days, and you're still getting under 10%. What kind of number are you sending in? Are you talking like millions or? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, so I mean, the free version of Google Analytics, um, there's a limit of 10 million hits a month. I'm not sure if you're going over that. Uh, you might be. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it, it's, it's, it was kind of designed in that way. I think originally it was designed kind of for web usage. Web usage wasn't sending in these crazy amount of hits. And so to make everything faster, uh, when you're trying to look at a lot of data, you use the sampling so that you can pull back the data a lot quicker. And there's kind of less processing. Um, there is kind of work being done to get, not get rid of the sampling, to make the sampling go down. Um, I mean, it's, I don't want to kind of mention it, but obviously we work on Google Analytics premium team, premium <laughs> team, that is kind of one of the benefits. But I mean, what we have some clients doing for the free version is using like pulling one day at a time and then joining it outside. Um, I mean, that's kind of the only recommendation I could do is maybe if you try to do one day at a time via the API and then try join things yeah. that way. I know it's not ideal, but. So yeah, if you have a, successful app and you try to track a lot of, of events yeah. within the app, at some point you will need to buy Analytics Premium. Um, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know for definite. Yeah. I mean, they, I know the team are aware of that, and especially with apps now, because I think the, app, uh, the thing with apps now, especially for example games, you're going to send in a lot more events. Um, so the team are definitely aware of that, and I think stuff, things are being worked on to see what we can do about that. Um, I can't like, talk about anything today, unfortunately, but I would say... But it's going to be better. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 sure yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's definitely Venture. something being worked on, and yeah. For now, advice would be try and pull out maybe one day at a time and joining it out externally, which I know is not ideal, but... 
well, the, the API is good, so yeah. we rely on that. Uh, cool. The There's a few tools that do it for you as well. Um, I think it's Analytics Canvas um, and Supermetrics, which work for um, work in Excel and work in Google Sheets. Mm -hmm. So that they have that built in to do it separately and try to avoid sampling. So it might be worth trying a tool like that. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Do you want to get? Hey guys, uh, I've started using Google Analytics lately, and uh, I have a lot of problems with the spam that hits the measurement protocol each time I, uh, and I don't have, haven't seen any fix on the internet like a Google fix. I've seen like filters and stuff. Yeah. But is there any fix coming up? Because uh, every thing I try is like a, not a long-term solution, so we still get crawlers and ghost spam uh, coming in. Uh, okay, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so I thought you said the measurement protocol. Oh, you mean like There's some of them spam the measurement protocol? I think you only need the UAID to spam it. So uh, oh, okay, so they're using the measurement protocol. Yeah. Um, you, so we've got a few bits of advice for clients uh, on how to solve that. Um, one of the first one is using the include filter. So yeah, only having name. your own host name, and that's still doesn't work for you? Is this stops the uh, ghost spam, but not the crawlers. The crawlers, we have to like remove them one by one. And if there's a new one, it comes back mm. and hit it, so. Uh, oh, okay, so the actual crawlers. Um, could could you maybe, uh, I've never tried that actually, but could you maybe try to uh, identify the crawlers IPs from, uh, so it's kind of cat and mouse game, but uh, identify the crawlers IP from your logs, server logs, and you because you won't have that in GA and try to exclude IPs from, uh, from the GA filters, which might work, Tiger, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, we've had some people, so there's certain things you can do from stopping the tag from actually firing. So some people will use Google Tag Manager um, and then have a logic in there to stop tags firing based on uh, certain IPs. But obviously, you have to recognize that server side yeah. before you actually load the code. Um, that is, unfortunately, a very difficult one. I know we. Have you used a new feature that we've released? Which to, one? Um, to block uh, bots. Yeah, bots and spiders, like. Yeah. But these are known bots and spiders, right? Um, like, I mean, when you have Simult or like other Chinese stuff that hits the website uh, yeah. to bring back to AliExpress or other websites, like some, uh, this yeah. can't be stopped, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a difficult one, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I feel honest, it, the, Doing like the filters, if that's not working for you, and you are seeing a lot of like certain um, bots sending traffic to your site, um, have you? There's a there's a support um, forum. Have you maybe listed those there? Yeah, yeah, we've listed. But like, what I was wondering is like, is gonna be a, like a real fix coming up by Google or no? Or like uh, just keep going filters? Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, we don't have. Like it's not a like a big problem. Answer. I mean, it's definitely, again, it's something being worked on, which is what the bots and spiders thing is kind of that first piece of that work to mm. help with that. Um, it's definitely a known problem. And we, uh, we're uh, always adding more to the kind of list that gets blocked. Um, but yeah, right now, I don't think we have kind of an answer on when it will be fixed or how okay. it will be fixed. Mm. But th there is certain kind of methods that they're looking at. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's things like honey trapping. So where if you don't, if if this GA account doesn't exist on any site and you're getting traffic there, then we might know it's a bot. So okay. certain things like that maybe. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Sébastien et Tahir. Pour suivre, ben, on va vous proposer de vous détendre un petit peu après cet effort de traduction dans votre tête en anglais et on vous propose une petite pause d'une demi-heure. On reprend les séances donc à 17h45 précises. Merci.